Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show where we talk about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm your host, Reagan Kelly, and I am joined by all my awesome co-hosts this week. How are you doing, Nate Heininger? I'm doing well. Glad to be here. And my real brother. I always say real. That doesn't make sense. And my bro host, <laughs> Shane Kelly. How are you doing, Shane? I'm pretty good. Well, we did have those like six episodes where that guy was pretending to be your brother and it turned out not to be, so it's good to uh, clarify now. Glad we've gotten rid of the pod person. Yeah. We're all pod people. This is a podcast. <laughs> oh. That was a bad pun. <laughs> and Laura Nash, how are you doing, Laura? <laughs> I'm feeling very literary this week. Yes, me too. Uh, because this week we are talking about uh, IF Comp, the Interactive Fiction Competition 2016. We covered this last year, and... Uh, we have covered interactive fiction a number of times uh, over the uh, the time our podcast has been around. Um, but if you're not familiar, uh, first off, if you're not familiar with interactive fiction, the short version of that is text games. Either games where you're in the very old school style, typing in text into a uh, into a uh, almost DOS prompt esque task park parser, where you're typing in things like "Go north, get lamp, light lamp with I don't know." match lighter <laughs> yes thank you <laughs> the words were escaping me and you can see how difficult some of those games might become if you are as bad at that as i am even just describing it uh and uh all the way to more sort of i guess modern freeform text-based games using things like twine uh these are things that are, that are more in the choose your own adventure style to use a very uh common touchstone um but with all sorts of interesting twists on the game design and on the subject matter. Uh, really interesting stuff still going on all the time in the interactive fiction scene. And all the games are usually really short, uh, which is part of the reason that we uh, love to talk about them on this show. Yeah, and IF Comp um, is, as uh, Reagan mentioned, it's 22nd year and there are 58 games submitted. And what's cool about this is if you play five of them, you can rate them and be a judge and you're part of the competition. It's not like this panel of unknown people up on a pedestal. We can be judges. You can be judges. Haven't you always wanted to be a judge? And playing five games for a competition sounds like a, a time commitment. But most of these games, first off, the, the rule uh, is that uh, you only have to play five, but you can play as many as you want. Uh, and then you can submit all of your ratings. You are supposed to give your rating after playing no more than two hours of each game. Some of the games may take more longer than two hours, but you're supposed to come up with your rating about its, you know, overall quality at about the two hour mark, or as soon as you finish the game, if it's shorter than two hours, which many, in fact, probably most of them are. Yeah. In fact, the game I just played was only 15 minutes long. So uh, yeah, many of them can be completed in a much shorter amount of time. They've also done a really great job at making these accessible and easy to play. Uh, some text-based games run in an interpreter. That would mean like you have to install some software on your computer, download a file, and run it there. But they package it all up in a nice zip file that you can download. It makes it really, really easy to play. Um, some of them uh, you can play just by clicking a link on the IF Comp website. So they've made it incredibly easy to browse through all 55 was it 55 did i get that number right 58 58 all 58 games and uh you can just uh randomly ch pick some or you can peruse the descriptions and uh and sort of cover artwork and get uh, a sense of what you want to play so they've made it they've done an incredible job of making these easy for folks who aren't big interactive fiction scenesters to uh download and try and for someone like myself who never really played any interactive fiction until we did it for this show, um, this is becoming something that I very much look forward to every year because, like you said, it, it's it's the easiest way to find games that should or most likely will be good. Uh, and if not, if you don't enjoy it, no problem. Probably took you like three, five minutes to get going, get started, and you can just move out of that one and go into a different one. So this week is probably just the start of our IF Comp 2016 coverage. Uh, we're going to talk about the games only came out. Today is October 3rd. The games just uh, came out on October 1st, and we've only had a chance to spend just a little bit of time with them. Obviously, there's 55 of them. There's no chance that by now we've had a chance to explore every single one of them. Still 58, but that's OK. Yeah. Ha, I keep doing that. <laughs> rounding down. Uh, but with, uh, with, those, with those, we've, we've uh, each of us gone in and played a few. Um, and we're going to start by just uh, naming the ones that we have enjoyed the most so far. 
Uh, we're making no claims that these are the best games or that these are the ones that you should necessarily play. You should look at the list and make some decisions for yourself about what you think seems interesting and play those. But here's what struck us as interesting enough to try and that we uh, got a good in, uh, experience out of. And then we're also going to talk about some of the games that we plan to play that have we haven't gotten around to yet. We'll be coming back with probably another episode, maybe as many as two more episodes about IF Comp before the conclusion of the competition, which is November 15th. All of your votes must be submitted by the end of the day on November 15th. So yeah, it's a it's a really strong group this year. Uh, it's the second year in a row we've covered it, and it's the second year in a row of it being the biggest ever. So it's getting to be a bit of a project to uh, to cover this. But we have before us some pretty cool games. Um, I think maybe the one that looked the most interesting to me, but I personally didn't have enough time to really dive into is Detective Land. It looked pretty pretty innovative. It's got some unique elements to it. Uh, who played Detective Land? I did, and it's amazing. I love Detective Land. So you mentioned that it's kind of an innovative system. So there is a, a type of interactive fiction game called parser-based where you have to type in commands, you know, go west, go east, get lamp. talk to, get lamp. Um, Light lamp with... Oh, wait, huh, what? Oh, what's my inventory? <laughs> but the really nice thing about this is they call it keyboardless because everything is buttons and the inventory is always visible and available. Um, if you're talking to someone, what you can say to them in conversation choices, you can just click around. You don't have to type a single thing in. Oh, wow. And I just yeah, looked looking at, your... at this UI. It's really neat. It's got um, along the sidebar here, I can see what you're talking about. I'm mm -hmm. also carrying, it lists what, the character is holding and wearing uh, and the things that they can see. It's like a cheat sheet. Uh, and I even see some pictures there. Yeah, so you get a, a kind of running script of what you're saying on the left side of the screen, and it's all in typewriter font, which is great because it's this 1920s noir feel. And if you're talking to someone, you can get a little picture of them, and it's paper clipped in as if it's a detective file. Like oh. The theming on this, even though it's entirely written like just the little sketches are perfect and it's so funny so you're playing a pi lance and rose and you've got um a bunch of people in your office and you can solve cases in whatever order you like um you're like getting the speakeasy there's some kind of food scientist that's missing and then there's like a horror writer who's like my house is haunted and he i think there's squid under it and you're like uh whatever you're a horrible person <laughs> and What's really fun is you're also uh, running around streets in your city, and it took me a little while to realize that it's a grid system, and I won't tell you how to figure out the grid system. I was just hailing cabs all the time, and I was like, oh, no, my money's going down. I like my money. <laughs> um, you can go to different locations, walk upstairs, but it's a parser with a cheat sheet. But what really makes it stand out, as I, I already said, it's super funny, but... Um, you know, the first joke, you're in your office, and one of the things that you have in your, um, you know, what you can see in the room is a door reading, if it's a tid, etav rip, it's private detective backwards. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so when you leave your office. I was like, oh, Latin. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what am I in? And you walk out the door, and it's like door reading private detective. <laughs> <laughs> and if you found that funny, you might like this game. Wordplay? Like that or, you know, any sort of, of humor or even puzzles that kind of play on the English language is something that almost nothing but IF can do. Um, I, I love when you see stuff like that. Yeah, just a couple lines that I had marked. Um, there's one part where you're uh, talking to a trumpet player and you say, that's some noise you make with that thing, I tell him, with a nod to the horn in his right hand. Thanks, he says. Learned it from Lizard Hips Morton, who learned it from Soapy Franklin, who was taught by Sponge Cake Jones himself. <laughs> Ooh, Sponge Cake Jones. That's some good yeah. writing. I wish I could read the entire um, letter from the editor of Grotesque Tales, but um, definitely even the sentence, the piece has no plot to speak of, and the coded and not so coded racism is a bit much, even for this era. In short, this is just the thing that we at Grotesque Tales are looking for. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny all of the mysteries are interesting good and unexpected and there's a lot of twists 
Um, I've never seen a mystery game that was sandboxy. It feels very much like a Grim Fandango, but much shorter and easier. There's also a great hint system. Um, wow. Similar to Grim Fandango, where if you go to any of the locations, you can go to a case, go to an associated location, and then click in, and it'll give you 10 to 15 small clues. So depending on where you got stuck in the puzzle, you can jump straight to it. It also... Um, if you get all the way to the ending, we'll tell you that the hints will only lead you down one of the three possible endings. So it's up to you to find the other two, which cool. I love. So wow. unabashedly, Detective Land only takes like an hour plus to do all four, even if you get lost. I used hints when I thought it was more fun to use a hint. Um, the hints also will sometimes mislead you in very funny ways. Um and uh, I think I got shot in the head multiple times, and I survived. Got shot in like... <laughs> this looks very... incredible. I can't wait to play it. I, I I think that interface really does seem like an aha kind of like, why have, ha, haven't they thought of this before? Because it seems kind of like an in-between point between uh, parser-based games that are sometimes very difficult to get your head around. They're not very accessible for newcomers, but they are really flexible and allow for really interesting puzzles and, and gameplay. Um, and like on the other end of interactive fiction, things like Twine or other more uh, more choice-based uh, styles of games, which are much more accessible and easy to play, but with much more restrictive kind of uh, you know gameplay ideas like you generally are just making choices essentially from a menu that kind of change in interface that kind of experimentation in how interactive does the interactivity of your if need to be uh is something where this game queen's menagerie kind of showed me something that i hadn't seen before uh not because it itself has a custom interface but because it's built with a tool that i'd never really gotten any experience with it's a it's a tool called uh, texture uh, that's at texturewriter.com. And um, the the UI there is all about um, kind of finding a middle ground between parser and twine style games where you're making choices. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's going to present you with text on screen and then show you some interactive words at the bottom that you can drag and drop onto certain words in the text, right? So mainly you'd have verbs like um, you know, punch and you drag it to the character that you wanted to punch. Right. Um, and, and I thought that was a really interesting thing. Uh, and the way it gets used in the queen's menagerie, which by the way, queen's menagerie is a piece of IF by, uh, did we decide it was Chandler Groover? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Grover Chandler Groover. A, yes. Not Grover, not the, not a Muppet. Um, so Chandler Groover, wrote has written some really cool if that plays with um kind of limited sets of verbs uh, i think is something that's that's unique to him uh like toby's nose was really cool um you only have one really important verb that is to smell um that was a great a great entry from last year um and this year he's actually entered two games both of them about a queen um queen's menagerie and the Queen and Mirror, I think is what it's called. Or Mirror and Queen. I might have that backwards. Mirror and Queen. Mirror and Queen. Uh, well, Queen's Menagerie is a very poetic, very simple piece of IF. Uh, there's no puzzles uh, or anything of the sort like that. Um, and basically, it's a story of walking through this queen's zoo and feeding the animals. You're basically the queen's zookeeper and you're going through and feeding um, all these sort of increasingly um, fantastical creatures. And the way that you interact with it is you walk into each new level or area of the zoo and uh, it has a series of paragraphs for you about the animals that are here. And at the bottom of the screen, you have usually three other animals to feed to those animals and you get to uh. pick which animals you feed to the other animals. Um, so, and as you do so, the sentence or, or the paragraph about that animal will change in response to what you've fed it. Uh, so he, you might have something that says something like, oh, here's a creature crossed between a leopard, a viper, and giraffe, discovered in an abbey of all places, below stairs, engaged 
in a ter- in terminating a poor monk. He hadn't <laughs> said his prayers. Wherever it came from is still undetermined. The abbot guessed hell. And they'll say, I feed it a bantam. It now says, uh, and here's a creature crossed between a leopard, viper, giraffe, breaking a bantam's neck. Observe that practiced ring. A farmhand couldn't kill a chicken with more expertise. It might be that they break souls the same way in you-know-where, gobble them down feet first. Best left to theologians, that debate. (laughs) I like that. And then you carry on to the next location, and you're presented with uh, more beasts uh, and more things to feed them. Now you're in the area with mermaids, uh, a squid, and you can feed them a minnow, an eel, or a pike. Neat. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And I actually played another game that was also made using this texture uh, system. And I don't know how new it is, but I certainly didn't have any real experience with it either. Um, There's a a game in the competition this year uh, by one of the developers who is working on texture. And uh, his name, if I can find it here, is Jim Monroe. I think he's working with one or two other folks on it. And that was Black Rock City. I didn't play enough of it to get a really good sense of it. Um, But it was a uh, it seemed to be a sort of an adventure about going to Burn. Burning Man. Um, so mm. if you are interested in playing other games in that style, uh, presumably he has a pretty good handle on the tool because he helped uh, create it. The, the tool itself, texturewriter.com, is something really interesting. I, 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 I decided to actually try it out and do their tutorial and play around with it a little bit. And it has a lot of power behind it uh, in a really simple interface. And one of the things that I really loved was that it had a built-in tutorial that shows you how to use it and you create kind of a very basic um, game right there in the tutorial. And by the end of it, I felt like I'd really seen all the tools that I really needed to create something pretty complicated, pretty complex. Uh, And you can just start writing. It's really neat. Um, This has been something I've wanted to do for a long time. I I, I always kind of have been on the the fence or on the edge of saying, this is the year I'm going to try and write something for IF. Uh, I I actually, just this just this past month, I, for all you podcast listeners out there, uh, I started listening to um, a podcast called Clash of the Type-Ins. And Clash of the Type-Ins is a really terrific podcast, kind of by, podca- by, uh, by text adventure authors sort of reading their games out loud uh, as part of this, this podcast. And there's a episode that I think is episode nine is where they sit down with Emily Short and they play through a game called um, A Day for Fresh Sushi, which is the example game in the Inform 7 documentation. Hmm. And I, that gave me kind of an, uh, another kick towards wanting to write my own IF. It's It's really a... Um, it's interesting to kind of start to see what tools are being used and see those behind the scenes moments. And compared to a lot of, uh, programming and video game, uh, creation, um, you know, modes, uh, interactive fiction is pretty approachable. I definitely agree. Flavor wise. I really enjoyed, I played a little bit of Queens Menagerie and it reminded me a lot of fallen London. If anyone plays that game, uh, the labyrinth of tigers. So there's coils and you, you know, there are also um, you know, priests running around and you, you get to descend into different layers. This felt like a much more immersive way to wander it. And um, I very much enjoyed just the few minutes I played. I, I just barely touched upon it. Shane, if you do write your own I have comp, uh, I will email you for codes to the game. <laughs> <laughs> Can you even? I don't think you can and submit something that you charge for. Or <laughs> yeah, charge for. So I, have, I think they all have to be free, which is one of the great, um, the, the the great aspects of this competition is it's a lot of free entertainment. <laughs> While we're on the topic of Chandler Groover, he submitted two games this year, as we mentioned earlier, and uh, I didn't play Queen's Menagerie, but I did play, although I don't think I completed his other game, Mirror and Queen, um, and it's really neat. It's uh, done in Inform, so it's par- uh, parser-based, but rather than be a straightforward, or I guess actually not that straightforward, uh, you know, go north, get lamp type of uh type of adventure no it's one more i played a little bit of it as well and and it's yet another chandler groover um you know kind of experiment with really limiting your verb set uh it's it reminds me of of galatea uh in in that you're 
you're limited to just picking topics of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but instead of being a conversation, it's really more of an inner monologue. Uh, you are playing as, I suppose, a fairy tale type queen sitting in front of her magic mirror and thinking about her life and just, you know, uh, reflecting uh, on things. Uh. Um, and what was really neat to me about this was that it's uh, it, it reminds me a lot of her story in that you're uh, kind of just typing in almost sort of search terms, you know, words to hopefully uh, direct the flow of her memory. And um, presumably based on what you're typing in, it's matching that against uh, paragraphs of inner monologue that's written for this queen. Um, it says in the description that it is uh, between uh, 15 and 40 minutes, which implies to me that there is an ending and I haven't been able to figure out how to reach that ending yet, but I only played it for about 30 minutes. Um, but the, the text was beautiful. It reminded me uh, a bit of some of the really great prose in some of Chandler Groover's, uh, earlier stuff. Like I really liked tag hair and I know a lot of folks did not because they're cat fans. I did like it, but, um, Chandler Groover, when he's writing this sort of uh, creepier style of, of prose, uh, really works for me. So um, that's another one to check out. And uh, if you figure out, I guess, how to end the game, I'm not sure if it has an ending, then I guess let me know. I'm going to go back to it. At Reagan with the, not the spoilers, but the hints. Yes, no spoilers, but hints. Um, so the, the main game that I spent the most time with for this um, was Blue Cactus Motel. And that's by Astrid Dalmati. Uh, last year, Astrid had a, uh, a game in the competition that we talked about on the show called Arcane Intern Unpaid, which was uh, very funny and and had some clever puzzles. Uh, but it was also a twine game. Um, you don't see a lot of puzzles in twine games, really. But this one was quite good. Um, but it, it placed but wasn't super high. But I think that she has a real chance of like taking the gold with this one. Blue Cactus Motel is... Um, it's uh, set in, you know, contemporary uh, Texas or the Southwest. You are a teen girl and her friends on a road trip to get out of Texas. You've graduated high school and you're on your way north. Uh, you're somewhere between New Mexico and Arizona on your way out west. And um, you stop at a motel. And I don't want to give away too much here. I don't want to be spoilery, but I, uh, you stop at the Blue Cactus Motel where not everything is as it seems. Um, and it has a really great, like almost old school adventure gamey kind of vibe to it. There's no like item puzzles or anything, but you're, you're walking around the motel talking to the denizens therein and all of them are weird, but it's also kind of beautiful. Um, and I have to say that just visually, Twine games often are pretty sparse. This one is gorgeous. There's no images, but it just makes an incredible use of just sort of font uh, to set a tone that really works. It, it's it's really impeccably designed in terms of like text. Just looks really good. Um, this one's about thirty or forty five minutes long. Uh, if you haven't played Twine games before, uh, Twine is a tool like what Shane was talking about earlier um, for creating games that are uh, in the more choose your own adventure style, but not necessarily just turn to page three to dodge and turn to page four to get hit with a fireball. Yeah, it's kind of the original and most famous uh, super easy, super accessible game creation tool. Yeah, uh, and it can do quite interesting, complicated things, um, but it is all still text-based and it's a hypertext uh fiction uh platform really works when it's applied well and here it really is um and so yeah if you are just trying to decide what to play i definitely recommend checking out blue cactus motel yeah that sounds pretty awesome um the game i played is was pretty unique uh, i i i've never really played anything like this uh, it's called the game of worlds tournament <laughs> and it Does is it have an exclamation mark at the end <laughs> it capitalized and with an exclamation point so it's the game of worlds and then all caps exclamation point tournament well acted nate that really came through in your voice there's no need to <laughs> thank you i've been practicing it for about a half an hour before we started recording you can tell yeah so uh this is a game where you are dropped into some sort of intergalactic card tournament, card game tournament. Um, Very topical with how popular uh, those are these days. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
which I love card games. So this appealed to me. You know, it's one You've of the been why summoned I... into Hearthstone. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it just kind of drops you in as you show up to this Galactic Tournament. It is uh, a parser. There's almost no UI except for kind of a border and a little uh, image that shows the world that you're playing, which I'll talk about in a second, and the most recent card played. That's it. Everything else is just text. Uh, you find out that you fulfill some role in the tournament known as the wild card. I don't really know yet what that means. And you proceed to play a card game entirely in text. Um, the game, it, it's interesting because as far as I can tell, maybe I didn't find the right command. There's almost no like instruction given on how the game works. You're kind of just dealt seven cards and it's like your turn. And you figure it out from there. Um, I, I was trying <laughs> like frantically typing help card game how how <laughs> card game work you know any <laughs> light match you know anything i could find that would give me some sort of description but i found that uh the more i just played cards you could uh you know one command you could look at cards and it would give you a brief description of the seven cards in your hands and um it, the game was kind of like if you took a game like Civilization or like a world conquering game and also added it with like Magic the Gathering isn't the right word, but like the 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 text and like names of Magic the Gathering cards, like they're very dramatic names, like the hungering and uh the fist of soul and stuff like that. And Basically, you start on a game world with a small population that inhabits one continent, you and your opponent. Uh, and like on the first map you play, there's 10 continents. So your job is by playing these cards to expand your population, expand your race, and defeat the enemy. Uh, seemingly either through combat or it looks like there's other win conditions. It's kind of hard to tell. Um and it's all just through playing cards, and uh, there's, like, counters, apparently, and you have a set number of them. I don't know how many I had. I just ran out of them. I couldn't. I was typing, like, check counter amount and things, and maybe I'm just not great at these parsers. But I really feel like I figured out the game to a degree. I won my first match, and... Um, wow. I, I've just pulled this up and started playing, and fortunately, it's built really to play well in a browser. Um mm -hmm. This is this is built in Inform Seven, which is really designed around those very traditional, like you know, go north, get lamp type of games. But wow, this is like this is like impl implementing a type of game in Inform that I've never seen done in Inform before. Yeah, and you know, to be honest, I started playing. I'm like, I I'm not good. Like this is this is kind of too much for text based. Like I like. Why can't I, I want to see these cards and I want to, you know, like look at my hand and cause I, I like card games. I've played a lot of different card games and though the more it became kind of challenge in and of itself to kind of like learn the game just off of the descriptions and playing it. And, and I found it that does I look by the way, really I don't know if it. you, if you found this, but I just accidentally found it. It has an option where you can pop up a, uh, a, a, a rule book. Dear God, are you, you serious? <laughs> yeah, I just did it. <laughs> that was what literally the, the, first okay. thing I, the first thing I typed, look, and it was like the Game of Worlds rule book, and you can click it, and it's a pop-up with, with what nine the, chapters all right. See, and okay. illustrations. <laughs> Sorry, I, Nate. Oh, uh, Reagan, just let him have it. Let him have his have his moment. Uh, I, right. I, I, I literally did not mean to give book. you a hard time. Reagan is such a cheater at these games. Nate literally was just playing mental chess card game the entire time <laughs> uh so i did say that i am not very good at uh interactive fiction so um i will take that when i continue playing the game will probably make more sense but i will i i think uh you know we'll spin this around and say that's kind of a testament to uh the game that it is to a degree like you know 
learnable. Like the the rules make enough sense that you can just kind of wing it and figure it out. <laughs> yeah, and it looks like it has amazing UI for a uh, for an inform you know text based game. Uh, lots of like I guess like uh, I get, what do you call that? Just like uh, there's sort of a frame around the 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 text yeah, prompt. It's very that, pretty. When yeah. I said there's no UI, I don't like. That he, there is a frame around it. I mean, there's just not much that you click on. It's really yeah. just text in the middle of the screen. And you do see when you play a card, there's a little box on the right that will show you like a design for the card. And then the, uh, the games take place on game worlds. And as you get deeper, I'm assuming the, the worlds get bigger and more challenging. Um, and you see like a little, like almost like a hologram in the right corner of what the world looks like that you're currently um, playing. And it was it was pretty cool. I mean, again, I won the first one. I mean, you might just win it no matter what. I don't know how, if you can how this game works for, like, fail states, but um, I, I, I th- thought it was pretty cool and very, very unique. And if you like card games like I do, I think it's worth giving a shot because I've not played – a not having cards card game before. <laughs> I definitely want to give this a shot because, well, first off, I don't think we mentioned it before. This is made by uh, Ade, uh, which is, I suppose, the uh, nom de plume uh, of the person who won IF Comp 2015 uh, with a game called Map. Uh, and Map was really, really interesting and good. Obviously, it won, so, you know, it had to be. Um, and reading the description here, I get the feeling that this uh, that this card game is just the first sort of layer to this experience. I don't think that the whole joy of this is the card game. I think that it's ultimately uh, building something out of that. If you read the the quick the like description here, it sounds sounds cool. It is a long million, this. The septum tower, held in the manifold by the tag these rings, grinds on and on, its gray walls pressing close. The only thing to look forward to is the long, cold, endless waste. The reuter lengths in the body, aloof... I'm not going to read the rest. It just really, like, sounds very otherworldly, so... I think there's, I think there's like, depths to plumb here that I'm really looking forward to trying. Yeah, I mean it I think it sets up right out of the gates that there's something bigger going on here. Um, you know, you're the wild card and what does that mean and what why is there this tournament and 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 you know, what is your purpose here? It is very much like asked right out of the gates. And then you also play this card game. And then also you don't ever type in look rule book and <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it now and I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me. You know what? I <laughs> like I always forget about I, I'd forgotten entirely about the command look. I was doing check everything and like I don't know, it didn't it wasn't hitting. The- yeah, that's where parsers really fall down. If you're, you know, if you're not like, if you don't hit on the right word, you are yeah. well, kind of out of check luck. rule book. Also works. So oh, there you go. No excuse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Mm. Well, there's well, a ton, ton of games uh, in this year's competition. Um, I played a few others, and uh, rather than go into a whole lot of depth about them, I thought we might just go through some of the others that we played, and maybe some of the others that we want to play. Um, uh, we already mentioned Mirror and Queen, which I uh, really, really enjoyed, and I'm going to dive back right right back into and try to to finish. Um, and I mentioned earlier that I'd played a little bit of Black Black Rock City by Jim Monroe. I barely scratched the surface on that one. It's uh, it's uh, texture based, and it's. Uh, uh, about Burning Man, and that's about all I really got out of it. I helped somebody fix their bicycle, and then I went into a uh, into a creepy looking place, and then uh, I got a game over, and uh, I didn't have the time to go back and, and try again. But um, uh, the other two that I had a chance to uh, explore were Pogo Man Go by Jack Welch and Ben Collins Sussman, which I mean, topical, right? I was uh, wondering if anyone played that. How was it? You know, it's actually surprisingly, like, well put together. Um, I'll be perfectly honest, it wasn't really my style of humor. I actually have played a fair amount of Pokemon Go, um, and this is a straight-up parody of Pokemon Go in, in form, so in a text parser, you know, prompt-based kind of format. Um, and so what you are doing is, like, you're in a city and you are typing commands like go north, scan it will tell you if there are any pogo men nearby you can attempt to catch them by typing things like throw pogo ball um 
so it, it on the surface it really is just sort of like a re-implementation of Pokemon Go in uh in a text-based medium uh which is funny in and of itself and then they also layer on uh like everything is named with a kind of a a funny uh you know reworking of a of a Pokemon name so um I don't have them in front of me so I won't do them justice but I'll just say that they they were sort of a funny uh I would say kind of lean towards like if you recall the the way that South Park kind of made fun of uh, of Pokemon way back mm-hmm. in its first uh, Gen Pokemon. Yeah, it, it had a, that kind of feeling to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's really interesting was, so I only played it long enough to kind of wander around and cu- catch a couple of Pogomen, right? Um, but just out of curiosity, and, and to be perfectly honest, this game didn't do a lot for me. Uh, I didn't really see myself going very much further with it, but I did take a look through the walkthrough, which is provided. Um, and, oh boy, does this game take some turns. So uh, if if that sounds appealing to you, uh, and you want to, uh, to stick with it uh, long enough to uh, for it to start turning things on its head... Um, it does it starts off with just a straight uh pokemon go uh parody and does kind of extend from there and i also have to say very well done in terms of just like technically um uh, as far as being a a well made uh, inform game i thought it seemed really well put together from what i played of it um well i will uh tell you about one that i do recommend and i know laura played it as well um, hit it briefly. It is 16 ways to kill a vampire in Ooh, McDonald's. I really want to play this wow. one. Great time. It's so fun. It is. And I've been watching uh, a lot of Buffy lately. And so. actually, I got to say for this one as well, a great cover image also. What a great logo. So this would be a twine game, I believe. Mm-hmm. And essentially, you are a, you're part of a vampire slaying team. Who uh, It's your off night. You, your role in the vampire slaying team is that you are the bait. Excellent quote from the that I took. Seriously, I can't show neck in a bar without someone tall, dark, and anemic sidling up to me and staring at my breasts to keep himself from ogling my jugular. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, that's like slide two, so it's not a spoiler. It's got some really good, really good language in it, and I. Uh, your basically it's your off night and again you are a vampire hunter but you're not the one who's actually like the one who does the killing you're just part of a team there's a maggie and i think was it jake or jeff or something like that is the other two members of your team but it's your off night and what do you do with your off night you go to get some fast food um because it's cheap and fills you up and it tastes good and what do you know? It's like 11 a.m. and, or I'm sorry, 11 p.m. You're in a McDonald's. There's a young cashier. And he's adorable. She's adorable. And the only other person or thing in the McDonald's is, of course, a vampire. A vampire that is eyeing the adorable cashier. So it is up to you within, uh, there's a technically a time limit within the game to figure out a way to uh, at the bare minimum, save the, the adorable cashier, but ideally actually slay the vampire and save the cashier all together. And it's great. It, there's uh, 16 endings uh, that, well, there's 16 good endings. There's uh, I don't know how many not good. I certainly encountered many of them. Um, <laughs> How many did you get to? Um, so just, you know, playing it today for the show, I got five or six kills or mm-hmm. good endings. And I got, um, I don't know, 10 bad. Wow. Sounds like it must be a real quick playthrough. It is. Well, it's very short. Well, and there's some it's real obvious hour. ones. Yeah. 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 There's like, there's some real obvious ones. It kind of becomes this little like memory puzzle game. So you'll like they do a good job of showing you um like you can go up to the vampire right out of the gates and there's like 10 things you can do to it but like six of them are grayed out and it'll be like spray with holy water but you can't so you click on it you can get holy water yeah. somewhere in the game maybe yeah and so it gives you it like builds in these little goals and then it's up for you to put together the like story pieces in a row and quick enough for you to accomplish these ways of dispatching the vampire. 
Um, it's probably under 10 minutes per playthrough. I said there's an hour, but that's the ticking clock. So every move is a minute to five minutes, depending on what you're doing. So you, you'll run through your time pretty fast. Um, yeah. And I really, there's one kill that I wish I could share because it's so funny. Um, but I will just say you've uh, never heard of, you know, Song of Songs being quoted in a parser game. I never thought that was going to be part of this. <laughs> this game also benefits from the uh, IF Comps website where it, ran- it lists them in alphabetical order. And so when you go to their website, the first one you see is 16 ways to kill a vampire in McDonald's, which I feel like has to be a choice. And <laughs> the, the, the smart, uh, uh, the smart, uh, uh, IF authors always give their their games a name that start with like uh, one thousand and one aardvarks or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. poor person <laughs> with five hundred apocalypses like thought he'd have first listing, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you if you notice just above that though, by the way, there's a random shuffle that will not only just let you know pick a random game for you to play, but will shuffle all fifty eight of the games into a random order on your uh, on your page, so that you can try to eliminate that from your uh, from your decision making process i think that was a new feature last year and it really helps yeah they've really actually done a few things to really streamline the process uh over the last uh few years uh just as a side note um between last year and this year uh, if comp uh, i guess incorporated as a non-profit um uh, or rather they have now a parent organization that has been created based from the uh, if comp called the iftf interactive fiction technology foundation um and there's a couple of interesting reasons for this, but uh, mainly it, they wanted to be a charitable nonprofit because, first off, that lets them accept donations for prizes in a way that's, I think, a little easier for them to do. Um, but also, they're trying to create essentially a nonprofit that can fund the making and maintaining of tools for creating IF. Brilliant. Uh, so making things like uh, a lot of tools for IF are uh, open source, just sort of by the nature of the of the scene. Um, but uh, having an actual nonprofit to kind of uh, help steer that ship, I think, is a really smart idea. There's clearly smart people uh, continuing to run the IF comp even 22 years on. Anybody have any other games that uh, you want to quickly call out as interesting, either ones that you uh, played or that you want to play? So I played a little bit of Fair by Hannon Andrasek, and he wrote, or she, I don't know, Hannon, gender neutral term, um, wrote Baker of Shireton last year, which was a insane game where you thought you were playing a game about being a baker and then it turned out you were a baker in an rpg world and you could like break out but most people didn't figure it out because it was so open-ended this one seems like um hannon has figured out that it needs a little bit more guidance in and people you know basically you're a science fiction author who gets roped into judging a kid science fair competition that's such a great pitch i love that so you walk around and talk to them, and then you have to judge them. And you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can sign your books in the corner and then just walk on stage and judge them, or you can actually listen to them. And I did that the first time. I, I just wanted to see what I could do. And so I just judged a fair, having no idea what I was doing. So I'm going to actually go back and play and talk to the kids because... <laughs> Um, I like an open-ended game where they don't force you to do anything, and um, I am sure there's a lot more to this. Um, but it seems like it has a much shorter timer than Baker of Shireton did. Um, and it it was really amusing. Uh, the kids seem terrible, which I'm always <laughs> pro. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. I really want to play that. Yeah, um, so I, I, I won't say I have enough to give it a full review, but I enjoy what I've seen so far. Well, we'll uh, hopefully be able to loop back to it. We're going to be talking about some more IF comp stuff in a future episode, I'm assuming. Um, so I, I have a few on the list that I really want to play. I love the description of Stuff and Nonsense by Felicity Banks. It uh, seems to be a, uh, it says, it's the year is 1860. The place is Bear Brass, Australia, a sprawling metropolis of tin, steel, brick, stone, and brass. Queen Victoria is visiting Bear Brass for Australia's own great exposition, uh, exhibition. Uh, all the sharpest minds of the colony have worked day and night to perfect their devices and displays. An infamous rebel named Emmeline Munchamore has declared her intention to gain independence for the state of Victoria. The two powerful women meet in the marvelous magical heart of Bear Brass. I just thought that sounded cool. So I- I'm looking forward to trying that one. Uh, and there's a bunch yeah. of others on the list, too, that just sort of stuck out either based on their titles or based on the uh, artwork that they upload along with the game. Um, 
Anybody else have any that you're looking forward to playing? I'm kind of tempted uh, by this one called Evermore, which claims to be uh, they, a choose-your-own Edgar Allan Poe adventure that supposedly contains over 60 of Poe's stories, poems, and essays, adapted, truncated, and respectfully disfigured, they say, <laughs> uh, like- into a single narrative uh, that branches. <laughs> and it sounds pretty cool. It's got a soundtrack. Ooh, nice. I'm looking forward to trying the shoe department, um, which is just described as... Teens! Yeah, well, anything with anything with <laughs> teens. Uh, oh. It says oh. what... Uh, um, you need to clarify that more. <laughs> uh, it's yes, I suppose I do. Uh, it says, "What has two tongues but can't talk and follows us everywhere we go? Our lovely leathery shoes, of course. The absolute last thing any person would ever expect to harbor a terrible secret." Fifteen-year-old nice. Michael Cherry, for example, has no idea. Yeah, I I read um just a no spoiler review of this. It said it was polished teens conspiracy, and I was like. I'll put this on my short list. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that was We enough. love spooky teen games. We we're entering <laughs> October. The oh, boy. gotta get ready. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing like a conspiracy. Um I think I arcane uh unpaid arcade intern. The order of those words are not in the right. Arcane <laughs> unpaid intern. Arcane intern uh, unpaid. Uh one of those. <laughs> Anyway, that was like I a conspiracy, and and they are witches. I don't think shoe department is that, but uh, I am always down for uh, kind of weird uh, teen adventures. The emotions are just right on the surface, right there. So good for fiction. Poor adults, we're all too full of ennui. Oh, I'm also, of course, looking forward to uh, Color of the Truth by Math Brush. Um, I know Math Brush made it. Oh, well, what is it that Math Brush made last year that I really liked? I can't remember now. Um, oh, it was Ether, the uh, the game about floating. Oh, yeah. I loved that game. Yeah. Well, uh, Math Brush has a new game this year, Color the Truth, a variegated verity. Uh Rosalina Morales is dead, and you have to figure out who did it. The four people closest to her had the motive and the means, her partner, her secretary, her ex-husband, and her sister. Relive the memories of Rosalina's last days and discover what really happened. But be careful. Everyone has something to hide, and everyone will color the truth. Color the Truth is a conversation-based murder mystery game that takes roughly two hours to finish. It is designed to be accessible to players who have never tried parser games and comes with adaptive hints by typing hint, which always is a plus. Always a plus. So lots of stuff left to try. Uh, We're going to play some more of these and come back with another episode about IF Comp uh, at some point before the end of the competition. Uh, So that would be November 15th, sometime between now and then. We're going to have at least one more episode on the uh, current crop of IF Comp games. If you have played any of the games for IF Comp and have thoughts or opinions and you want to express them in some way other than a simple vote, please write them to us on Twitter or via our website. Go to www.theshortgame.net and you can write into our contact form and let us know which games we ought to be trying um, or you can tweet us at underscore short game uh, you can also find me on twitter i am your host reagan kelly and i am at uh, reagan k r-a-y-g-a-n-k laura where can people find you you can find me on twitter at laura j nash and shane where can people find you you can find me uh by the time this episode airs perhaps uh glue having a a, a PSVR glued to my face. Oh, I can't wait to talk about that. Uh, and where can they find you on Also at 8 Bit Shane. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and Nate, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at NateSTL. And thank you guys once again for listening to The Short Game. <laughs>